morning, Restoration Life. Here live from the building. And I know most of you guys are watching me on Facebook Live because uh, we're a little thinner this morning. So um, I don't know if you guys are all trying to go out and enjoy the weather, hiding from the heat or hiding from the virus. But uh, we're just going to take this moment, this holy moment that God gave us to worship our God, to fellowship together with those who might be with us in the room that we're in. And uh, together we're going to ask God to do what only God can do. So if you join me, Father God, we come before you this morning with arms open wide, with hearts open wide to say, God, do what you want to do in us. Your will be done. Lord, we recognize when we pray that prayer, it doesn't always match our will. In fact, oftentimes it doesn't. And that's a scary thing for us to hand our will over to yours. But we just declare this morning in Jesus' name, we trust you. We trust you with our life. We trust you with our possessions. We trust you with our relationships. And we know, God, that you will do better for us than we would do for ourselves. And so we say together this morning, not my will, but yours be done. In Jesus' name, amen.
takes faith to sing this from a place of a prison just like John the Baptist who sent messengers to Jesus said hey I'm in prison and you're moving are you the Messiah and so oftentimes we have that question for God where are you Lord I'm in prison haven't you seen and Jesus is like hey hearts are being healed people are being restored remind be remembered of this be reminded of this stir up in your heart and know Jesus was speaking from a place knowing that the cross was in front of him. John, you've got the same destiny I have. But God is working. God is moving. Amen? So let's sing this out with faith, even from a place of defeat, knowing that the cross is what overcomes. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, you work. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop. We make miracle worker, promise keep light in the dark. Miracle worker, promise me light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 That is. I declare that my situation and my experience does not define who you are. You are who you are. You are who you revealed yourself to be, Jesus, when you came and died on the cross. And my circumstance will never defy who you are. It will never change my confession. Here it is. 
who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise key. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. in the now and I don't always understand I don't always get to see everything when I'm holding up my hands when I'm counting every breath Lord all I need to know is you choose me I'll praise you for my breakthrough Till my song becomes my trial I will sing because I trust you Shutting out the noise I know that you will speak Clearly When I'm living out my faith When I'm stepping on the sea I know you take my hand And walk with me Walk My breakthrough till my song becomes my trial. I will sing because I trust you. I will bring my heart, I will lift my song. Oh, oh, oh. oh worship.
Jesus, you fill my heart. You satisfy my heart with good things. There is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. Nothing can take your place. It's connection and relationship with you, Jesus. I just want you and nothing else. And nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. Jesus, even my obedience to you is, is worship to you, Jesus. It's drawing near to you. Even when I deny something in my flesh that I may want, it's because I want you. It's because I know it doesn't satisfy. It won't bring lasting satisfaction, Jesus. I know you, you bring that. So I push everything else away. It's about you being my greatest and biggest yes. And nothing else. Oh, nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do. I just want you. And nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Oh, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Oh, nothing else, Jesus. Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else will do. I just want you. Hallelujah. is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ leave behind your regrets and mistakes from today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious. 
precious blood of Jesus. If you're thirsty, this song is just saying, come and get a drink. Don't beat yourself up for being thirsty. Just drink. Come to the altar. Understand forgiveness. Understand His grace. Understand His love. Let go and worship God for His goodness. Amen? Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. son returned he had a script of repentance he had a script father forgive me I've wasted so much the father just cut him off and just hugged him and loved him man what an amazing thing <laughs> I'm not saying we don't have to repent because we do but I'm just saying you got to understand the heart of the father that's so there and ready to receive and welcome you back put the robe on you and clothe you with his righteousness and say you're clean you're dressed in righteousness oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ cross as you wait for your crown tell the world of the treasure you found oh the treasure you found amen precious blood was bought our precious forgiveness was bought with the blood of Christ and Lord as we think about your blood that was shed for us God we remember today that on that cross when you died something changed for all eternity 
that when your blood was shed, our sins were forgiven. And Lord, that free gift of salvation was offered to all mankind for all time. And God, for those of us who have reached out and said, I would love to have that free gift. God, you have granted us forgiveness. Your precious forgiveness. Lord, that we would be declared clean, set free. That God, all that would hold us back has been removed. And God, you have given us new life. Life in you. The Holy Spirit that indwells us and gives us power. And God, I ask that every person who is listening today would hear these words, not just with their ears, but all the way into their heart. That God, your promise for us is that sin no longer is our master. We have been set free in Jesus' name. And because of the precious blood of Christ, the things that hold us back no longer need to hold us back. And Satan is a liar, and we declare that again today. Satan, you are a liar. And all the lies that you are telling people right now, the fears, the pain, the sorrow, the suffering that people are going through, that this is their reality. We say no in Jesus' name. Because we know that the reality is, God, you have taken those things captive. Lord, they no longer rule over us. Lord, we were meant to be free. The Scriptures say, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And I pray that every person who is listening today, that they would give their life to you in a way that you would... Set them free, God. Set people free from the fear over COVID. Lord, we know it's real. We know it kills. We know that we are in your hands. We know, God, that there are a lot of things out there that are scary. But nothing on heaven and earth or anywhere below, nothing is outside of your power. Lord, your will is going to be done. Lord, we are not changing your will. Nothing is changing your will. Lord, as I prayed at the outset, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I pray that over every ear that is listening, God, over every heart that is out there, that, God, we would trust ourselves to you. We just sang out the words, because I trust you, God, may that be true of every one of us, that we would trust you, and because of our trust in you and what you've done on the cross, we would truly be set free. God, there are people in our congregation today who are hurting at the loss of a loved one. Think of Audrey and Sherry, and Mike and Amanda. And God, I just cry out for them. God, set them free from the pain of loss. Do a miracle, God. Father God, I also know that there are people in our church who uh, have been tested positive for COVID. Uh, Lord, we thank you that, that is not, they've not spread it. That's good news. But Lord, there are people who are quarantining right now. And there are many others, God, who have been exposed to the virus. And God, we know that any one of us tomorrow could test positive. And so, God, we ask that you would continue to watch over this congregation. Our prayer has been that we would not lose a single one because of this disease. Lord, to date, that's true. And we thank you for that. And we pray that would continue, Lord. Watch over your people. But God, I pray against fear. That there would be nobody who is taken captive by fear because of COVID. Lord, may we trust in you, may we be responsible, but may we trust in you. And Father God, there are many in our congregation who have other struggles, Lord, whether it be financial or relational. Lord, there's uh, a lot of unrest in our world today as we look at how many things are broken, as we as a society look at racism and not too long ago with the Me Too movement and how women are treated and mistreated. God, we have serious systemic problems in our world. And Lord, these are things that can steal our joy as well. But God, I pray in the midst of trying to do what is right and good and bring your shalom into this world, Lord, may we not lose peace. May we not lose peace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you this morning again for joining us. Um, I want to share a couple of announcements with you. This morning, there's some really good stuff coming up, but uh, let me just say, if you're new to Restoration Life, and I know that uh, during these times, um, it seems like, well, how's anybody new going to come and visit? But if you're new, whether it's online or here in the building, uh, we just want to welcome you and say that we want this to be a place where we keep it real. And here at Rest Life, we try to keep it real. We try and let the scriptures be our guide, and we try to just live according to that in light of that, knowing that none of us are perfect, uh, but we are trying to keep it 
the way God wants it to be. And so uh, you're welcome here and we'd love to serve alongside of you. Uh, we have an elder vote coming up in a few weeks and if you would like to do uh, be part of that, uh, part of helping us decide who should be leading this church for the next season, uh, you need to be a member and if that's something that you've not done and you'd like to become a member here at the church, please reach out to myself or Pastor Mark, uh, Pastor Dan at RestLife.net, Pastor Mark at RestLife.net. Uh, shoot us an email and we'll walk you through how you can become a member. For those of you who are already our members, I want you to know that uh, on the 24th, we're going to have the elder vote. It'll be an email, and so we're going to give you like a couple of days to respond to that email because we don't want to require everybody to come down in person and vote. So this is unprecedented. We've never done it before, but I think that's pretty much true for all of our lives every day now. Everything seems to be a bit new and challenging. And so uh, that's coming up. Also, uh, we just encourage you to continue being faithful and giving. Although uh, church is not going on as normal, church is going on. And we're continuing to try and operate all of the systems that we set up to serve and worship in our community. And so uh, if you would just continue to be faithful in your giving, that would be a huge blessing to us. There's three ways that you can give. Uh, you can give online. You can go on restlife.net and go on the drop-down menu and click on giving. You can set up uh, an automatic deposit, so every month, that's what my wife and I do, it's really simple. Uh, you set it up with your bank and it goes directly to the church. And then lastly, you can drop it off here at the church or mail it in, uh, 5801 2nd Avenue, it'll come to our church and we can take care of it that way. But thank you guys for your generosity and pray that you guys would continue to just serve God well in whatever season he's got you in. And I've talked to a lot of you guys. We're not all experiencing life the same way right now. But wherever he's got you, that you would be faithful in that place. Also, um, we have a video we want to show you this morning for the women's uh, retreat. So our women's ministry, the Arise Women's Ministry that we've kind of retooled and relaunched uh, is right in the middle of the COVID. And they had this amazing retreat planned on the heels of last year's amazing retreat bigger, better. It was awesome. And then COVID came and we said, well, I don't think we're going to be able to do all that. And amazingly, these women got together and came up with a petite retreat that is fantastic. And I've had an opportunity to talk to them about it. And I know it's going to be really special. And in some ways, I wonder if this isn't even better than what we had planned. Uh, I'll leave that to you guys, but it's really, really good. And we're going to show you a video, uh, just a little promo. I want you ladies to start signing up for that so that we can get a good head count that's coming up October 16 and 17. So let's go ahead and cue that up.
All right, so you got a little snapshot there. I uh, just want to tell you, this is something you can sign up for right now. You go to restlife.net and click on events, and you can sign up for that. It's open to all ladies, so if they don't go to Restoration Life, not a problem. Uh, we'd love to welcome your neighbors, uh, friends, folks that go to other churches. I know this is going to be an amazing retreat because uh, Megan and Rachel planned a retreat last year that was the best ever, and uh, they bring a lot of uh, beauty to uh, what they do, and it's going to be a good word, it's going to be good fellowship, and it's going to be right here in Midtown Sacramento. So uh, super awesome. These ladies have put the, together an opportunity to make the retreat work in the times that we're in. And so I uh, just want to encourage you ladies, get yourself signed up. Don't wait. Uh, let's get some excitement behind that, and let's really take advantage of the opportunity to have an amazing women's team and amazing retreat. Uh, also, for the guys, I just want to throw out some dates. Uh, Wild Man Weekend is September 25, 26, and 27. Uh, Ron Brown is also putting it on this year. He did a great job last year. So uh, it's an opportunity for guys to basically, we just hop in our cars, head up to Nevada, and go out to the Bureau of Land Management, which I call the Wild Wild West, because it's a place where there's pretty much no rules, and it feels like you went back in time. And which of us don't want to go back in time right now? So uh, we'd like to go back to a better time. So uh, September 25, 26, and 27, Ron Brown, he's getting sign-ups going. And so if you want to get signed up for that, contact him. Let him know. Let me know. Let Pastor Mark know. But uh, we would love to get you signed up for Wild Man Weekend. It will be capped off. It's not open to as many as want to come. I think it's around 25. So get your name on the list. Let us know that you're planning to go so that uh, we can plan all the events for you. That's uh, camping, uh, kind of rustic, um, it's man-style weekend. So Wild Man Weekend, September 25, 26, 27. I'd love to have you guys come and join us for that. All right, so we, uh, we're jumping into a new book, but it's not really new because uh, this is 2 Timothy and we just finished 1 Timothy. So the themes and the ideas uh, are pretty much... Uh, continuing on from the first letter Paul wrote to Timothy to the second one. It's still, you know, Paul, the older, experienced pastor leader who's speaking and passing on what he knows to Timothy, who's a younger leader. And we're going to jump in today uh, into chapter 2 because chapter 1 I actually preached on uh, a Mother's Day because this is a, uh, uh, the chapter 1 kind of speaks to how Timothy got called into the pastor, and it speaks specifically to his mother and his grandmother who passed faith on to him. And so that was a, a unique opportunity we had on Mother's Day to kind of look at the power of the influence of a believing mother and a believing grandmother. And we know that Timothy's father was not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And just the encouragement that comes from knowing that ladies, even if your husband is not there with you, you can pass faith on to your kids. And Timothy is a great example of that. So we looked at that on Mother's Day. Uh, today we're going to kind of transition right into 2 Timothy, but chapter 2. And before we do that, I just want to uh, share with you a concept that you probably have already heard of, but uh, maybe some of you haven't. It's, it's the R not principle. So if you're listening and you're like, wait, the R not, let me tell you what R not is. R not is the, uh, the technical description of how a disease spreads. So right now we're in the time of COVID and COVID-19 has an R0 number assigned to it and it, it basically represents how fast and how quickly the, uh, the disease spreads to the people around the person who has it. So if I had COVID and I was around 10 people, how many of those 10 people would get that COVID from me. And the, the R0 number for COVID-19 is actually, as best we can tell right now, is right around 2.4. So if there were 10 people around me and we're in a room and we're having a great time and I don't know that I've got it and I'm spreading it, that 2.4 of the people in there on average, so obviously we're not going to cut anybody into a fourth, but, but 2.4 of the people in that space would get the COVID-19. That's how it spreads. So even if you're around somebody who has COVID-19, it doesn't mean that everybody in the room's going to get it. This is just an average number, so it could be three one time, it could be four, it could be one. But on average, it's 2.4. And so what this means is that every time two people get it, then four people get it, then eight people, then 16, then 32, then 64, then 128, and you can keep doing the math, and after 30 days it spreads around the entire world into the billions if it just doubles every day. 
And so that's why we understand with COVID-19, the R0 number tells us that in about a one month, 30 day span, you can spread this virus from one person to the entire world. So that's why we've had to really push the curve down and try to lower the transmission rate. That's why we wear the masks. That's why we socially distance and we wash our hands. It's we're trying to slow that spread so the R0 number goes down. Now, if you can get the R0 number to go below one and stay there, then effectively what you do is one person has it and less than one person gets it and actually it declines until it completely disappears. And that's how you get rid of something like a COVID-19 or the measles or any other thing that is contagious. You have to get the R0 number below 1. So right now we're at an R0 of 2.4. We'd like to get below 1. And of course, if we get um, some kind of a vaccine that people who are exposed to it no longer get it and don't pass it on, then that number goes below 1. And effectively, we could get beyond COVID-19 as we know it today. Now, just to give you an idea of how this works with other things that spread, influenza, which is the common cold, is a 1.5. So not quite as contagious as COVID-19, but 1.5 people who are exposed to it typically get it. And you guys all know this because you've had somebody with the flu next to you at work and you know that can spread around the office. But it's 1.5 people for every one person who has it typically will be spread. Now, uh, measles, I don't know if any of you guys have ever had measles, but measles spread at 14.0 or not. So that means if one person has it, 14 people are likely to get it. So that one's a super contagious. The measles, uh, you basically just have to walk by that person, you're going to get it. That one's really bad. Now, smallpox, which uh, um, is, you know, we've gotten rid of smallpox and there is a vaccine for it. But smallpox is actually a 7.0 R0. So that one's extremely contagious as well. And Ebola, that's one that we've all heard of because it's been in the news in the past few years. Extremely deadly. So the R0 doesn't speak to how many people die from it, just how many people contract it when they're exposed. Ebola actually is a 2.0. So for every person that gets it, two people get it. So it does spread at about the same rate as COVID, but with a much higher death rate. So this idea of an R0 is a basic reproduction number. Now, the reason I'm telling you that this morning is because I want you to understand just kind of the science behind how things spread. But I'm going to ask you this morning to, to just focus on the R0. Because I'm going to use this example of how the gospel is spread. And of course, I, the gospel is a good thing. COVID is a bad thing. Now, I don't want you to get stuck on that. I just want you to understand the principle of the R0. Because God is asking us as the people of God to take what was given to us and pass it on to others. And the challenge that he's going to give us in Timothy through Paul this morning is that we would be people who successfully pass on the good that God gave us to others. The are not of your Christianity. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1 and 13 says this, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard that me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. Reflect on what I am saying for the Lord will give you insight. Remember, Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained, therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Here is a trustworthy saying, if we died with Him, we will also live with Him. If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we disown Him, He will also disown us. And if we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot disown Himself. And so here at Second Timothy chapter 2, Paul launches into a challenge for Timothy, and it's all about the gospel. 
And he speaks here about Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descended from the dead. And he says, this is my gospel. It's why I'm suffering. It's why I'm in chains. It's what, it's what I've devoted my life to. Paul literally laid down his life. He forsook many of the things that we pursue. He was not married. He didn't have biological children. He didn't buy a house. He didn't have a 401k. Paul put his entire life on the line for the gospel, to live out the calling, to share the gospel. It was all about the gospel for him, which literally means the good news. The good news is that Jesus died for you. And he wanted everyone to hear that. He wanted everyone to experience the freedom that comes from being set free. So he devoted his life to it. And now he's turning and he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, I want to admonish you, to encourage you to do the same. So he says, my son, be strong in the grace that Christ Jesus has given you. And verse 2, the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. And there it is. That's the are not. Paul is challenging Timothy to share what he's been given with others who will then share it with others, who will share it with others, that it might spread. Years ago, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, one of my favorite authors, wrote a book called The Tipping Point. Now, The Tipping Point sold a lot of books, and you may have read it yourself. You've probably heard bits and pieces at least. But it's this wonderful book that he wrote to help us understand how do things go from like, well, they exist, to everybody knows about it. So like right now, you've probably heard of TikTok. Well, TikTok, somewhere along the way, tipped. It went from it existed to like everybody's talking about it. And Malcolm Gladwell said, how can we understand the process of how this happens, the science behind it? Is there a way that we can codify this and understand it so that we can reproduce it, we can interact with it better? And what Malcolm Gladwell did is he actually studied outbreaks and how outbreaks happen with disease and how when we track those things, how it goes from it exists to it tips. And all of a sudden, it's everywhere. How does something go viral? And so in his book, he looks at a lot of examples, but the one that really jumped out to me was uh, Vans Shoes. The shoes called Vans. And so when I was in junior high in the 80s, in the early 80s, Vans were all the rage. Now, I know because I have kids of my own that Vans are actually quite in right now. But my world, early 80s, junior high, no self-respecting kid at Sutter Middle School would show up without vans on. Like, that was a thing. And he tells the story and the tipping point of how that happened because vans existed for quite some time before that. But they were shoes that only the skater kids wore. The kids who rode the skateboards wore vans. They were, they were shoes that were made for skateboarding. And it went from a few kids who were into skateboarding, this small part of our population to it tipped and it became something that schools all across America kids were buying vans and basically as he breaks this down what he helps us to understand is that things spread from one person to another person from one person to another person and every once in a while there's a super spreader who spreads it to a lot of people but basically you can watch the spread and you can go back and track it and it's just like the are not you see, things are spread one person, one event, one interaction at a time. That's why we have social distancing. That's why we have people staying at home as we're trying to slow a spread. But things normally, in a normal world, will spread person to person at different rates. The are not is different, but it's how things spread. You are constantly affecting all of the people around you. If you go out and you buy a new car, all the people on your street see you buy a new car. They're more likely to go out and buy a new car. In fact, this just happened to me. One of my favorite restaurants that I like to go and get a hamburger at is Cookie's Drive-In. Little hole in the wall over in East Sacramento. I've been going there for like 30-some years. They have a great burger. Uh, you probably should try it out. It's 57th Street and H if you want to try it out. But one of my favorites. Now, I've been going there, like I said, for years. I order the same thing almost every time. Bonanza with cheese. It's one of my favorite cheeseburgers that God ever made. And I'm very thankful for it. But when I went on a hiking trip with my nephew 
a few weeks ago. We were out there hiking for a few days out in the wilderness. You know, you're eating like freeze-dried food. You put a little water in it. Like, you know, it, it feeds you. But we were walking back to the car on the last day. And my little nephew started talking about going to Cookie's. He couldn't wait to get home and go to Cookies because like me, his dad grew up going there. He's been going there his whole life. And he goes, man, I'm going to get a corn dog. And I was like, a corn dog? Like, I mean, I, I think I knew that they had corn dogs on the menu there, but I never got one. I mean, I enjoy corn dog, all right, but that's kind of like cheap food, right? So I'm like, I always get the hamburger with the cheese on it. So I heard him, and he was going on and on. I think maybe a little drool was coming off his face, and he was like, I'm going to get, get three cheese dogs, or I'm going to get three corn dogs. And So we were walking down, and I was just listening, and somehow that got in my head. Because yesterday, I went to Cookie's, and I was about to order my Bonanza with cheese, and something inside of me said, you know what you really want is a corn dog. And I ordered two corn dogs, and they were fantastic. And I was thinking about this sermon after I had that experience, and I was like, oh my goodness, my little 13-year-old nephew planted that in my head and caused me to take an action I would never normally have taken. And that, my friends, is our not. His idea spread from him to me and changed me. And that's exactly what Paul's talking about here in the context of Christianity we are meant to take what was given to us and pass it on to others. That's why he says in verse 2, the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses. So Paul's been saying these things. Timothy was the one hearing, receiving. He says, the things that I've been pouring into you in the presence of many witnesses. So he's been pouring it into Timothy and others. We don't know how many, but Paul has been passing these things to others. He says, those things I want you to turn and entrust to reliable people. So now Timothy is going to take these things and he's going to share them. Who will also be qualified to teach yet others. And so this idea of passing on the faith goes all the way back to the beginning of God's plan for the church. That one wins one wins one. Or better yet, two or three or four or whatever the are not is for that person. And so he's encouraging Timothy to make this his normal routine. And through Timothy, he's encouraging all of us to make this our normal routine. You see, you and I are meant to take the good news and pass it on and share it and just talk about it. You know, my nephew wasn't like, Uncle Dan, you got to get a corn dog. He didn't hard sell me. He just told me how excited he was to have one and I wanted one. And this is how God wants us to share the good in our own life. That we would take that good experience that we have, that, that God who loves, the God who sets free, and we would share it in a way that other people would go, you know, I think I want that. Who are you listening to? How much influence do you have in your life? You see, Timothy could not pass on what he did not know. But he knew because he listened to Paul. And who are you entrusting the things that you've learned to? Who is it out there that knows about the goodness of God because of your story? And then lastly, who are they going to pass it on to? Who's going to benefit from the passing on that goes even beyond you? There is a spiritual legacy that is built when we do this. And so this is Paul's challenge to Timothy. And this is Timothy's challenge to others. And literally, you and I would not be here today if people had not taken this up and lived it out. We're here today because somebody passed it to somebody who passed it to somebody, and over 2,000 years it's continued to be passed on. And it was passed on to me, and it's been passed on to you. And then verse 3 and 4, he says, Join me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. And as he's helping Timothy to understand what it means to make the sacrifices necessary to share this, to pass on the good news, he uses three examples. The first one is as a soldier. He says, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus, suffer like a good soldier. What does he mean by this? Well, if you're a soldier then you are going to set aside some of the normal comforts in life so that you can do your job 
and you can serve well. And when you become a soldier, you're asked to make that commitment and then you're held accountable to it. Our friends Gabriella and Dan Jones, uh, Gabriella was part of our church here, led worship, wonderful part of uh, Restoration Life, married a great guy, and because he is in the Air Force, they moved far away to North Carolina. And he's in the military. And just recently, she's pregnant with their second child. She posted on Facebook, hey, pray for me, pray for Dan, because he's going away for some special training for six months. Now think about that. She's pregnant, they have a little baby, and he's leaving for six months. Like, who does that, right? Well, he has to. That's his job. He took, a, he took a, a, an oath. He took a vow. He said, I, I'm going to serve my country in this way. And he knew it would require sacrifice. And I remember when Gabriella was marrying Dan, she knew, and he was very clear, I'm going to have to serve my country, and it's going to cause both of us and our children to sacrifice. And there are many who have served in the armed forces who understand that the ultimate sacrifice is even laying down your life. That's a possibility. And so Paul here says that you should serve like a good soldier because he knows that the imagery there is clear to all of us that if you're going to do your job well as a soldier, you have to put aside some of the concerns that might entangle you. Earlier in 1 Timothy, I, I shared an example of, of how the church should be more like a battleship and less like a cruise ship. And the imagery here is that if you look at a battleship, everybody who's on the battleship, when you walk on there, they've got a job to do. They're soldiers. Like some people, their job is to cook food. But they're helping this battleship to be a, a ship that is equipped to do its job. And so if your job is to cook, cook well. Because if people aren't healthy, the ship's not going to be able to function. There's other people with other jobs. All the way up to the, the captain who's in charge of making sure that they stay on course and do what they're supposed to do. But everybody has a job. Everybody. There's nobody just hitching rides on battleships because it's fun. It's a job. On the other hand, if you were to walk onto a cruise ship, you would see a completely different experience. Now on a cruise ship, most people, they're just there to bask in the sun, watch a movie and eat too much food. That's what you do on a cruise ship. It's all about you. And they're like, we want you to be comfortable and happy and have this great experience. So everything's set up for leisure and enjoyment. But there's a small group of the people on the ship who are the crew. And they're running around taking care of everything, making sure that everybody has everything they need because these are paying customers. A very different type of ship. And if you imagine these two types of ships, the cruise ship is full of people who are like, hey, can I get another margarita over here? And the battleships full of people who are like, hey, you need to get to work and get this done. We've got to get all of our work done so that we can, you know, get a few hours of sleep and get up and do it again. It's a very different environment. And what Paul's saying is that we, as the people of God, need to understand that in some sense, we have been called to be soldiers, to be like soldiers anyway, in the, in the sense that we would put aside some of the things that we would normally want to do in order to do what we were made to do, called to do, equipped to do. What evidence is there in your life that you are a good soldier? What have you suffered? How is your life any different than a person who is just a civilian in that sense of they can do whatever they want? They're not under orders. They don't have a task. You see, God is challenging us through Second Timothy to be people who say, I am willing to accept sacrifice. If you're going to have an R naught that's better than one, you're probably going to have to make some sacrifices. You're probably going to have to do some things that maybe you, make you feel uncomfortable or, or not do some things that would make you feel really comfortable. Sacrifice is part of having a good R naught as a Christian. And then verse 5, he says, Similarly, anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. And so he takes a second example and he goes, all right, so you didn't like the soldier one. Try this one on, an athlete. Many of us have played sports in the past. I grew up playing sports. I still love a good sporting event. And he says here that you're not going to win if you don't play according to the rules. You don't get the victor's crown. Well, what are the rules? If you don't know the rules, there's no way you're winning this game. So what are the rules 
for a Christian follower of Christ. What are you supposed to be doing? Well, there's five things I want to just share with you briefly this morning that I think kind of sum up the big picture of what it is you've been asked to do. This is what we're supposed to do as Christians. Number one, prayer. Ah, You want me to pray more? Why don't you just pull a tooth? That sounds painful. I, I got to tell you, I've been doing this a long time, and prayer meetings are not the thing that everybody like clamors to go to. Uh, we have some events that are very popular, some things that we do <clears throat> that people love. A prayer meeting tends to be lower down on that list. There are some people who are called to prayer and are prayer warriors. Can I just tell you, nowhere in the Bible does it say, that's for a few. The rest of you, you don't have to pray. You see, every Christian is called to be a person of prayer. That's why it's part of our core values. No prayer, no point. You don't get to be a Christian who doesn't pray. That doesn't exist. If you're a Christian... You have to talk to the God that you serve and you have to listen to the God that you serve. And that's exactly what prayer is. God has called you to be a person of prayer if he's called you to be in his family. It's communication. It's relationship. Prayer is essential, not optional. Secondly, evangelism. It's kind of what we're talking about with the are not this morning. Passing on the good news. Now, look, there's a lot of different styles people have used to pass that on. There's everything from bullhorn guy who stands out there and annoys all of us to door knockers who also annoy all of us. There's a lot of people who annoy me, apparently. But evangelism is simply being a witness of what you've experienced and passing it on to others. Everything from friendship evangelism to pick your style. What is it that you're doing to share the good news with others? To share, to raise that or not in your life. This is something God called everybody, every one of us to do. He said that we would be witnesses. It's just telling your story. I mean, really at the, at the heart of it, it's telling the truth as you've experienced and lived it out. Is Jesus alive? Did he die on a cross? Does it make any difference? The way you can best answer that is just share your story. If you're living it and you're talking about it, that's evangelism. That's something God's called all of us to do. And I would just encourage you as you do that, be bold, but please don't be obnoxious. We've already got that category filled. All right. Fellowship. The third one here is fellowship. Uh, Fellowship is when we get together and we encourage each other. God said that we are better together. We're a body fitly joined together. We're like a, a stone wall that's, you know, fit together with mortar all the pictures in the Bible picture not an individual but a community and God created us to fellowship and he said when you get out of fellowship that's when you're vulnerable don't be alone be together with the body of Christ lean on each other confess your sins to each other pray for each other encourage each other sing together pray together be together so fellowship is a big part of what we're called to as well and that's why we gather together as much as we can and in this season it's hard it's hard to gather together and be safe and so we're doing this via facebook live because we still want to connect as much as we can and we do zoom meetings and so on but we need each other i need you you need me we need each other and this is part of what it means to be a good christian is to stay connected in fellowship then fourthly worship Worship is when we give worth to God and primarily the way we experience worship as Christians today is through singing. We get together and we sing. We take a chunk of time every Sunday morning and we sing together because when we lift up our voices together and sing together, we are telling God as a community, God, this is how we feel about you. And it's, a, it's a, actually the, the thing that probably more than anything else in Christianity, people get excited about worship. We love worshiping together and praise God for that. It's, it's exciting to be with God's people and worshiping Him together as one. It's a little harder right now, but we look forward to the day when we can all be back together, worshiping together. And this is something that, that God tells us we'll be doing for all eternity. If you were to take a peek into heaven right now, you would see worship happening, ongoing, 24-7 before the throne room of God. Worship. We were made to worship And then lastly, number five is obedience. It's kind of what ties all this together. And actually, as I was uh, listening to Nick this morning and he was leading us and he actually used the word obedience. Uh, Obedience is a key part of this. If you as a Christian 
are doing all kinds of things, but not out of obedience, but out of obligation or because you're trying to somehow earn your way to, to heaven. Uh, God says, that's not what I want. I want an obedient life. An obedient life is a bent knee. It's a not your will or not my will, but yours be done. It's a it's a choosing to lose so that others can win. And so obedience is not easy. It's hard. But all of us were called to walk in obedience. And there's going to be things in your life that you're going to hear from the word of God. You're going to hear the Holy Spirit say to you and you're going to go, I don't want to do that. I don't like that. And when you get to that moment, you're going to have to make a choice. Obedience or disobedience. And let's not get ourselves. There's really only two categories. You're either obeying or you're not obeying. And God has called us to a life of obedience. And so this is something where, again, we work this out over our journey. None of us get it right all the time. But obedience is, is a part of what God called you to. So as we look at this competing according to the rules, that's kind of a broad sweep of what it means to be a good Christian. It's these five things, prayer, evangelism, fellowship, worship, obedience, that we would walk out our life in such a way that each one of these five would be a regular and sustaining part of our Christian example and then verse six he says the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops the hard-working farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops now i know that here at rest life we're not a congregation made up of farmers uh, we enjoy food but we don't actually grow it uh, some of you guys robin threlkeld are doing a great job of growing tomatoes in your backyard but we're talking here about somebody whose job is to get up before the sun and go out and work hard to produce the food that feeds people, the hard-working farmer. And so he uses him as an example, and he says, you know, your Christian life should look like a hard-working farmer too. And, and I want you to know, God recognizes hard work, and God recognizes hardly working, and he knows the difference. And God's looking at your life, and he's encouraging you and admonishing you through Paul, through Timothy, through the Word of God, through me today, to be a hard-working Christian, not a hardly working Christian. And I want you to know there's times, like Ecclesiastes says, there's a time for everything. There's a season for everything under heaven. Look, we get that. There's times when you're hurting and you just need to heal up. There's times when you've been pushing hard and you need a break. But the normal Christian life is it's hard work. It's hard work to show up for prayer meetings. It's hard work to show up for work days and serve people that you don't even know. It's hard work to be a Christian sometimes. And God says, yeah, and I'm okay with that. I mean, Jesus was working hard when He was here on this earth doing the Father's will. He wasn't sitting on a mountaintop humming, asking people to come up and ask Him the meaning of life. He was out with the people he was serving the people. He was healing. He was hour after hour after hour. Crowds of people came with needs. And he was giving of himself. Hard work. Paul worked hard. Timothy worked hard. I work hard. Like, working hard is part of what God called us to do. Not overworking. There's balance. Balance is key in everything. But ask yourself, have I been working hard at building the kingdom of God? Or have I hardly been working at building the kingdom of God? Paul's admonishment is, work hard. By the way, there are rewards in heaven for those who work hard. He speaks here about the hardworking farmer should be the first to receive a share of the crops. What is it that you receive when you work hard? You actually receive rewards in heaven. And I remember as a kid hearing this and going, wait a minute. If I work hard and I get rewards, and I get to heaven, and it's a perfect place, and everybody's totally happy, why do I care if I have any rewards? Like, why not just squeak in by the skin of my chinny-chin-chin, and get into heaven, and whatever, I'm in heaven. Like, I'm not going to be sad. I don't know, maybe you guys are much more spiritual than I, I never thought those things, but I thought those things when I was a kid growing up in the church. And I just want to encourage you, the Bible tells us that there are rewards in heaven. And as an adult, and with my adult faith, I look at these passages that speak to rewards and I go, there must be something to it. God wouldn't be giving us rewards in heaven if we were going to get there and go, I don't even want it. Thanks, but no thanks. Like, I don't know what heaven's going to be like in its entirety. I have a tiny little glimpse. You don't either. But what we know is God says, when you get there, you're going to enjoy the reward if you've earned it. And so... Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 and 14 says this, 
By the grace that God has given to me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder, and someone else built on it. But each one should build with care. And, and here, this is the same Apostle Paul, and he's given the same message about this are not, this pass it on, but he's using the illustration of building. He's saying that God allowed him, Paul, to build a wise foundation, and others are coming and building on that foundation, people like Timothy. And then he says, each one should build with care. And he's speaking to us, and he's saying that we should also continue to build on that same foundation that the early church leaders laid down. Then verse 11, he says, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has already been laid, which is Christ Jesus. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, straw, their work will be shown for what it is. Because the day will bring it to light. And it will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. And there it is. You can get into heaven by the skin of your chinny chin chin. That is a thing. But he's saying how much better it would be to be a wise builder during your time on this earth. To, to have a good R not, to pass on good stuff to others, so that when you get to heaven and everything is tested, there will be things that are eternal that last. What from your life right now are you pushing your shoulder into that you think has any chance of surviving for all eternity? It's not your house. And believe me, I know all about this. I'm working hard on a house right now. But I know it's all going to burn. There's a lot of stuff we put our shoulder to that is not going to last forever. And that doesn't make it wrong. It just means we should all consider, am I balanced in my life? There, you need to like go to work and earn a living and pay your rent. Like I get that. But God is calling you to build a foundation of faith that you would take what's been given to you and you would pass it on to others who would then pass it on to others. And that is what will last for eternity. And that's where our reward is. And then in verse 7, Paul says, Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. And that's exactly what we're doing this morning. We're reflecting on the things that are being said from Paul to Timothy so that we can learn from that example so that you and I can do well with the life that's been granted to us. What is your are not? What difference is your life making in the lives of those around you for eternal purposes, for the kingdom? Are you creating a legacy? Are you more like a soldier or a vacationer? Are you more like an athlete or a spectator? Are you a hardworking farmer or are you a consumer? You see, we're supposed to contemplate these things. And at the end of our contemplation, we're supposed to go out and do with what God has given us an even better job than we did yesterday. By God's grace, tomorrow I will be more faithful than I was yesterday. And this is God's challenge for all of us. Not that you would try to be perfect, but that you'd be obedient and faithful. And that because of your faithfulness, somebody else is going to be influenced in such a way that they say, I want to be set free from sin. I want to be set free. Show me the way. And this is how we pass on the faith. One day, one moment, one relationship at a time. So I just want to encourage you. Look, this is not meant to be a heavy cross that you bear. This is an invitation to join God in the work that He's doing. And it's good and it's fulfilling. And more than that, it's what you were made to do. Because of the sin nature, sometimes we think we were made to enjoy life. That we're here to be happy and find happiness. But ironically, happiness is found in purpose in the purpose you are created for. There's a reason why we find joy in serving. It's what we were made to do. There's a reason why we find joy in worshiping. It's what we were made to do. It's not necessarily what you're going to see on the commercials on the television, but it's truth. And you'll only understand it when you live it. And those of you who have served others, worked a good hard day, gave everything away, didn't ask anything in return, you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's beautiful when you get to lay down your life in Jesus' name and it 
feeds you deep on the inside. And this is the life that God called us to. But along the way, there's all these voices that call out, all these shiny things that beckon us. No, go here, find happiness. You need another road trip. You need another car. You need whatever. And those things are not necessarily bad, but they can take you from what is best. So I just want to encourage you. Think about your are not. Think about what difference you're making. Think about your place in the kingdom of God. Are you being a good soldier, a good athlete, a good farmer, like Timothy was called to be? Father God, we thank you this morning for the word that breaks it down for us and makes it so clear. Lord, I thank you for the clarity of the word this morning that speaks into our lives and says, what are you doing with what you've been given? And Lord, I pray for all of those out there who are feeling winded, feeling like they couldn't possibly take on another thing. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would give them the wisdom to know what to set down. Lord, that they would take some of the stuff that is in their life and let it go. And God, I'm pretty sure that for most of us, it's not that we're doing too much ministry, we're not serving too many people. It's us serving us. Or us listening to voices that we shouldn't listen to. Father, help us to get to that balanced place where we live a life that is both fulfilling for us and life-giving to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's rise and we're going to sing uh, Oh, Come to the Altar. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the way of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink of the well? Jesus is calling. arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes who life is born Oh, Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus. Father, we are thankful today. Thankful for your blood, thankful for your people, thankful for your word, thankful for your Holy Spirit. Lord, thankful that we get to live in forgiveness. Because, Lord, we sure need it. We come up short. We think thoughts. We say things. We ignore things that we should do. 
And God, your forgiveness covers all of it. And we thank you today in Jesus' name that we have been set free from condemnation. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And so I pray in Jesus' name, after preaching a word about our job to serve and serve well, that we would not do it out of condemnation, but we would do it out of the joy set before us. That we would do it because we want to serve a God we love. That, Lord, we would not perform for you, but that we would serve with you. Lord, help us to have the right mindset today. And I pray that we would not believe any of the lies of Satan. He is a liar. That we would hear with clarity what your spirit is speaking to us. That you have invited us into something beautiful. Lord, may we embrace it for its beauty. And so, Lord, I pray over our congregation today. Lord, you know where every heart is at. Lord, meet us in that place. Holy Spirit, speak words of affirmation to us. This is my will for you today. And Lord, may we respond in obedience and joy, living in the light of the freedom that we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being with us online. Thank you guys who are here in the house today. God bless you all. Be safe out there. Make good decisions.